I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture with Robin Dupree, um, who's standing in for John Drinkwin. Um, and the lecture tonight is How is Removing Derelict Fishing Gear is Recovering Marine Wildlife. Um, Robin is with the Northwest Straits Marine Conservation Foundation. She's the executive director. She's worked as an advocate and educator for marine environment for many years with a particular focus on community engagement in issues surrounding stormwater, toxics, and cleanup. Clean Robin holds a BS in environmental science and an MA in political science and environmental science. So without any further ado, Robin. All right. So I am going to chat with you a little bit about our derelict fishing gear program. So when we talk about derelict fishing gear, what is that? What are we talking about? Here's this net. This net was found um, actually off of the west side of San Juan Island on August the 17th. And we then recovered it. Um, this net was lost by, a, by a, a fisherman who was having mechanical problems and had to cut his net free, um, which is not something that any fisherman wants to do. Um, and so he reported it immediately to the state reporting hotline. And this net has been in the water for one week when um, our divers went down uh, to um, recover it. And you'll see that um, it is uh, entangled in this rocky reef kelp habitat. Uh, and in addition to the organisms that have already been captured and killed in this net, it will, over time, if it's left um, there, uh, begin to uh, destroy the kelp itself. Um, there is a uh, little baby seal. Uh, young uh, seals are very curious. Uh, so we will uh, find um, uh, young seals more than older seals uh, entangled in the gear. It went down to check it out, and it, it uh, drowned. Um, and this net was 1,500 feet long, 100 feet deep, uh, so it represented 150,000 square feet of netting. Um, and it ranged in its depths from 2 feet to 70 feet in depth. Um, if left there, um, this net would begin a legacy of uh, trapping and killing a wide variety of marine organisms. Uh, some of the nets that we have uh, recovered have uh, been in the water for 20 years. So this net, in one week, uh, managed to, um, our divers found 10 living and 30 dead red rock crab. 12 living and 38 dead kelp crab, 30 dead uh, uh, spiny dogfish, 25 dead sockeye salmon, 5 dead chinook salmon, 30 um, unidentified rockfish, 40 uh, kelp greenling, 1 harbor seal, 90 flatfish, 110 spotted ratfish, and 30 lingcod in 7 days. So I'm not going to, this, this uh, film goes on for quite a few minutes, and, I, and I'm not going to show you the, the whole thing, but I wanted to give you a sense of what it looks like and what is it, what is it doing when um, it's under the water. Um, you can hear our diver in the background. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to point out is periodically you'll see a lot of smaller uh, prey fish um, hanging out behind and around the net. They are um, attracted um, here because the net has caused the kelp to bend down. It's created numerous little hidey holes and places for the uh, forage fish to hang out, um, which then attracts in their predators. And so then the predators um, get captured in the net um, because they're seeking that prey um, or they're curious like that little harbor seal. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Northwest Straits um, uh, Foundation, and um, then I'll get into talking a little bit more about our work with derelict fishing gear. So the Northwest Straits Foundation is a partner to the uh, congressionally authorized Northwest Straits Marine Conservation Initiative. 
And the initiative was created um, in the late 90s, uh, originally as an alternative model to uh, conservation up here um, uh, to a marine sanctuary, which was being considered at the time. Uh, Northwest Straits Initiative's model is unusual because we um, are, are really built from the bottom up. The scope of the initiative is a seven county region, all of the counties that abut the Straits of Georgia and Juan de Fuca. Um, and um, a lot of the energy is with the seven county-based marine resources committees. Those committees are citizen volunteers. Uh, they represent different interests within their community um, and they're appointed by their county governments to uh, serve on the MRC. So I'd like to point out Marta Branch, who's the MRC coordinator for San Juan County. Barbara Bentley's here. She's the chair of your local MRC. And you have a lot of new members. Are there any other MRC members? No others. Um, but you know, if you, if you don't know about your MRC, I really encourage you to get to know them. Um, they're doing great on the ground work. Um, and the work of the initiative is really based on those local folks identifying conservation priorities for their home waters and then getting their boots in the mud to fix problems. So then each of those committees um, has a seat at the Northwest Straits Commission. And the commission is the regional coordinating body. Um, so each MRC has a seat at that table, as, and then the governor appoints uh, five members to that table, and the Department of Interior makes a tribal appointee. One of the things that's interesting about the initiative is that there's an explicit statement that we honor tribal treaty rights, and so you see that through a lot of our, our work and through the participation of um, various tribes. Um, and so the commission plays a regional coordinating role. They have access to a little bit of federal funding to help fund the work, um, uh, the baseline capacity of the MRCs. Um, they sponsor uh, uh, scientific gatherings um, uh, and um, other um, uh, events to help the local MRCs build their capacity. And then we come along at the end, you can't really read that very well, Northwest Straits Foundation, and we're the private nonprofit partner to the governmental entities that are engaged in the initiative. And so what we do is we promote and implement science-based um, uh, restoration and education, um, and we work with the MRCs to help them gain capacity uh, for special projects, uh, funding support for things that they might like to do. Um, and then we also uh, access um, uh, funding support for big projects, such as the Derelict Gear Program, um, which we run out of the Northwest Freights Foundation office, or um, uh, we have a growing shoreline restoration program where we work with different communities around the region to, uh, to restore natural shorelines, take out hardened shores, um, and bring back um, natural shores with uh, native plants um, to benefit um, often forage fish and salmonid species. So that's our, our bundle um, of work and, and one of the big things we do is we run the derelict fishing gear program. Um, so our program in here in Puget Sound is really interesting. We have one of the worst, derelict fishing gear is a problem that is really global in scope. Um, and um, as we of course fish everywhere in the world's oceans, we've left our um, our gear behind us. And um, here um, in the Salish Sea, we have a, a really one of the worst um, uh, accumulations of derelict fishing gear. And one of the reasons for that is that we have all these rocky habitats um, that are likely to snag nets and then um, collect them as they might drift around. We have also, because of our um, um, because we're a fjord, we don't really have a lot drifting in from the open ocean. So it's a it's homegrown problem, um, and primarily uh, uh, because of our robust Puget Sound-based fishery, um, which is, of course, less robust today. Um, so we have less um, um, in the world of, of lost nets. But we had a big historical fishery um, and a very robust recreational fishery, um, particularly um, with um, uh, crabbing and, and shrimp uh, pots. So all of this material has been likely to be lost. The program, the problem was really identified as a priority for marine conservation in 2001. 
um, and uh, the initiative as a whole worked with um, the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the tribes, and other partners, uh, uh, NOAA, um, in their marine debris program to, to try to develop some um, uh, protocols for safe and effective removal of, of this gear. Um, the problem was originally identified actually by a marine resources committee. Um, the Clallam County MRC um, identified the problem and wanted to do some work around derelict fishing gear in uh, Clallam County. And it's a great example of how projects then bubble up through the Northwest Rates Initiative and become region wide. <clears throat> so one of the things we pride ourselves on is that we're really science based. Um, and we began in 2002 um, with um, uh, uh, gear removals and um, we uh, manage a statewide derelict fishing gear reporting system and maintain a database um, uh, of uh, everything that we find in those nets. <clears throat> So priority ranking, um, uh, we, we did some uh, priority ranking project in 2007 and identified nets as our uh, highest priority versus uh, uh, crab or shrimp pots. And the reason for that is because of, of the nets tend to have much broader, more multi-species impacts. Um, and um, also, one of the cool things about this retrieval program is that because we, um, because of both of the fact that the remaining, there isn't a big fishery in Puget Sound anymore, and the, uh, the gear is really improved. So we have an opportunity to actually fix a problem and not experience a lot of reoccurrence. So um, it's, it was a, a wonderful challenge to go after. We estimated um, that there might be upwards of 10,000 nets in depths of 105 feet or less in, um, in the region. So it was a, it was a very, uh, very big task. Um, we um, looked at uh, species impacted, we looked at habitats that were impacted, and we also did economic research to understand what are the implications of this gear um, on the, um, the, the current fishery as well as the, um, the uh, uh, recreational use. We um, really got off on a regional scale in 2009 when we received um, $4.6 million in federal stimulus money to um, work on Puget Sound. Um, so onward, how do we find it? That's one of the more interesting questions. Um, and what we do is first, our team looks at what, uh, we look at the bathymetry of the shorelines that we're interested in um, to understand what does it look like on the bottom? Where are the places that nets are likely to accumulate? And of course, they're likely to accumulate in rocky reef habitats. So then we have um, access to some really cool technology and we use side scan sonar um, to uh, then go and survey those areas. So you might not be able to see this very well, but that long linear form there, that's a net. There's another linear form, that's a net. And so what they do is they look for these unusual long forms. These nets may be buried, um, or the, in, a, in a sonar uh, like this, you can't really see um, in, in granular detail what they are really gonna um, look like when you get down there. And, and these may or may not always be nets. So what we call them at first is targets. Um, and we've um, mapped the targets around the region using side scan sonar. Then what we do is we return with divers. Um, our program is all, um, all run with um, divers who are um, experienced harvest divers. And we find that using harvest divers uh, is, is really a good choice because they know how to work under the water. Um, and they can spend a long time um, down there. Um, so they then, we go, they go back, um, they identify um, those targets um, as nets or as, as uh, false, false um, identifications. And um, the last way that we understand where this gear is is that folks report it to us. 
So we have, and we'll talk about this a little bit, but there is a no-fault reporting law now in Washington State where a fisher can report their lost net and not be penalized. Um, so um, it, they're much more likely to report. And then we also rely on citizens who may find a net um, or the floats from a net um, and they can call it in. And when they do, we dispatch a vessel to go um, explore it. So then what do we do once we have found the net? We, um, we worked with the state to develop removal guidelines. Um, we um, have um, uh, uh, several vessels that we work with. They're um, often uh, uh, adapted fishing vessels. And we have um, teams of divers that work. Um, they are using, as you'll see here, um, they use um, surface supplied air so that should anything uh, go wrong when they're down below, they have unlimited time. Um, this work is very dangerous. Um, there's a high potential for entanglement in the gear. Um, they're literally cutting it off by hand and hooking it onto um, the winch which pulls it uh, up. So um, we, are, um, we maintain a um, fabulous safety record um, and we've had no injuries or, thank goodness, fatalities in, um, in, this, in this program. So then we collect a lot of data. Because this is a science-based program, we're not just hauling these nets out. We're trying to understand with every net what are the impacts of these nets on um, uh, these subtitle habitats. And, and how do we do that? Well, what we do is we start with the report, um, which, which the, the biologist fills out um, in the field. Um, that is then inputted into an online database uh, where we gather information about all of the, the species found. And um, folks can go online and report derelict gear, in which case then after we've um, truthed it, we go, all that information goes back into the database. Can you all see those little blue dots? No, it's very high. Um, so these are um, removed derelict nets um, in the Puget Sound region. We have done some work um, on the outer coast. We've done some work um, working with Canadian partners, but our primary focus is um, our, our part of the Salish Sea here, and you'll notice an awful lot of nets up here in the San Juans. Um, so we have um, removed to date 4,605 nets, and of those, 2,049 were found in San Juan County. And you can see really where the accumulation zones is, and that's no big surprise. You've got all these rocky habitats, and this was a really big area for the commercial fishery over many years. So, species impacts. Um, well, we could do the guessing game of um, who all these are. Um, I, I find that to be a little bit of a grim exercise, personally. Um, so, um, what do you think? We've got a harbor porpoise up there. A little river otter. You can't really see this guy. There's our um, harbor seal. <coughs> Who knows what that guy is? Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, he's being, he was um, found alive in the net, um, but he was beginning to be eaten by that guy. <laughs> yeah, um, and then of course, you know, our ever-present friends up there, the dogfish. Um, there's a uh, copper rockfish, and then down here we have a link cod, dogfish, and a ratfish. All manner of organisms are getting caught um, in the nets. Um, and interestingly, it's not just crab pots that catch crabs. So we have um, found a, a very high number of um, the variety of crab species um, here. Um, uh, in my neck of the woods, I, I live up in, in Bellingham, and, and just north is uh, Point Roberts. And um, Point Roberts, uh, there is a, a shelf where it's deep, there, there, there's deep water and then the shelf brings it up into shallow water. And that shelf is actually part of a crab migration corridor. 
where the Dungeness crab come up out of deep water and molt up in the shallow areas. So um, that, that shelf is also a place that really likes to attract nets. And all these crabs are getting caught up in the nets. Um, and we did a little economic analysis and figured that that spot was costing the crab fishery $250,000 a year, just that one little spot. So um, we have um, a, a, a fair bit of, of work to do to continue to, to remedy the, the challenge. Um, this, I, I'm, a, I'm a bird lover. This is a heartbreaking photograph for me. Um, this particular net was found off of uh, Port Susan, which is the uh, little bay between Snohomish uh, County and, and uh, Camino Island. Um, they found 150 bird carcasses in this net. So the diving birds are particularly impacted um, by, um, by this uh, derelict gear as they get entangled. Um, and I still, no, we haven't figured out who that is or what, what, what kind of bird. He's so decayed. Um, these guys were mostly scoters. And then sometimes we get a lot of that. And you know we're trying to catalog everybody um, in the nets, and uh, it's kind of hard because we get a lot of bones. Uh, so we uh, usually bag those up and we send them off to a lab at the University of Washington for identification, um, so that we can um, really accurately assess the nature of this problem. So what we did here, uh, we wanted to understand so. We found a certain number of critters in these nets. What does that mean? Uh, what does that tell us for how many organisms may have been captured in those nets over time? Uh, because what happens, of course, is that things decompose. And soon, uh, these bones just drop out of the nets. So how do we know what, um, what was really ever captured there. So what we did was we, we did a study where we chose four known nets um, and we had our divers dive on them and tag all the carcasses that they could find in the nets. Then they dove twice more and um, in, in just in the interval of just a few days between dives um, and tagged all of the new carcasses that they found and noted which um, organisms had disappeared. Uh, because they're, they're decomposing and they're getting eaten um, or just rotting away. And then by analyzing that data, we worked with a team from UC Davis, and they were able to develop a projected mortality model. Um, and what that model helps us do is estimate how many animals are killed annually in the nets that we have removed based on the numbers of um, uh, carcasses and parts of carcasses that we find in the nets. One of the nets we chose was off San Juan County, um, right off the west side of San Juan Island, actually. And it had been derelict for 15 years. And we know that because it was um, identified by a Department of Fish and Wildlife researcher 15 years prior, but there was no uh, known safe uh, uh, removal program yet. So it stayed there. And so we, we had um, a really clear sense of how long that particular net was in the water. Um, and so during that study, we were able to understand, at counting the number of organisms that that net was still capturing, how many animals had been killed by that one net. Um, and then, of course, we removed all the nets after the end of the study. Um, interestingly, we found about a 7 to 14 day uh, decomposition rate amongst um, uh, most organisms. Um, and, and a 17% dropout rate. So as the net is hauled up, approximately 17% of the carcasses fall out of the net. Um, so, you know, our model is uh, certainly not um, that tight, and we could be underestimating um, uh, or overestimating, but we believe based on the dropout rate that we're underestimating the, the numbers. So here are the numbers. Um, as of just this last December, we had found 49 marine mammals. Um, interestingly, one was found alive. So uh, we believe we found that net, you know, 
very uh, moments after somebody got entangled that, that a, a, a mammal could still be alive. Uh, 904 bird carcasses, 4,350 fish, um, there, they had better, better luck. Um, we, I was on the derelict gear boat this last fall, and we found a beautiful red uh, Irish lord uh, rockfish that we were able to release. Um, it was still in good shape, but I don't know, you know how it would really have fared going back down. So we, we don't always know whether these, these numbers here, the live organisms, whether they survive. Um, and um, hundreds of thousands of invertebrates, primarily uh, lots and lots and lots of crabs. So then we extrapolated based on this model that we developed with UC Davis. And so for marine mammals, the, that 49 mammals represented 1,289 mammals that had most likely been entangled in the nets, only the nets that we have removed to date. Um, the 904 birds um, translated into 23,785 birds. These are primarily the diving birds, right? So we've got cormant, cormorants and grebes, um, a variety of um, mirrors and pigeon guillemots. Fish, um, again, the numbers are startling. Um, our 4,350 uh, fish uh, turned into 93,000. And nine, um, and note here, canary and other rockfish. Um, and um, based on some of this work, uh, derelict fishing gear has been identified as a stressor for um, uh, rockfish as the recovery plans are being developed for um, endangered rockfish. Um, so kind of, kind of stunning. Um, we believe that we, uh, those nets, those 4,600 nets have been responsible for the mortality of um, three and a half million um, organisms over the years, which I just find that to be such a grim tally. Um, but um, the bright news is that that's three million organisms that aren't gonna die now um, because we've uh, permanently removed that um, threat to their lives. So um, habitat impacts um, are another huge piece that we're greatly concerned about. Um, yes, we are concerned about the individual organisms and their individual lives, but um, the other big challenge with um, these derelict nets, as you saw in the little film, uh, is that they can have great impacts to the kelp beds and other habitats in which they get entangled. And they do that as the tides pull that net and the currents pull those nets. They can scour um, the, the hard surfaces. They can collect sediment and become, and become buried and change the, um, the uh, bathymetry. Um, they can destroy the vegetation, um, impede access in the case of that crab migration corridor, uh, and uh, disrupt uh, whole localized ecosystem processes. And I just love this little guy there, that little wolf eel hiding out. What happens, um, or, or this little guy, you know, these nets can then take away those little hidey holes um, and uh, trap um, those organisms as they're trying to find uh, good places to um, hang out and do their lives. Uh, so we uh, have uh, restored 632 acres of subtitle habitat um, by removing these nets. We uh, did um, a research study in which we um, tried to understand if we pull these nets, how will the habitat recover? And uh, so what we did there was um, we selected three derelict net sites um, and one crab pot site. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about crab pots in a moment. But, and we, we documented the habitat impacts of the gear and adjacent control sites. What did we find? What did it look like next door? Um, and then after we removed the gear, we returned a year later um, to find that in most cases, the um, uh, habitat was in um, pretty robust recovery mode within a year. Um, now, the uh, eelgrass habitats tended to fare um, uh, a little more poorly, and they don't tend to recover as uh, quickly. And, and the eelgrass habitats are primarily impacted by uh, derelict crab pots. Um, now, on the outer coast, those crab pots can have a huge impacts because they're the big commercial pots. Uh, it's such a dynamic environment uh, 
that those pots um, are, are carried along very quickly um, and they can gather up in bundles and they call them flower pots because the, the numerous um, uh, crab pots on the bottom become sedimented in and they become the base of that flower pot and then all of their uh, buoys rise up like little flowers. Um, and um, there, you all remember that fishing boat that uh, capsized on the outer coast just a couple years ago? Um, they believe that might have actually been entanglement in a, in a flower pot. Um, they can also be a real problem for marine mammals. Um, we don't have that as much here um, within the, um, the waters, more protected waters of our, of our inland sea. So then the question becomes, if we do this work, how do we make sure that in 10 years we're not cleaning up derelict nets again. Um, and so we um, have done some work to estimate um, annual net loss. Um, because our fishery is so much more uh, uh, smaller in scale, we'll call it, um, we, we believe that we're losing 10 to 30 nets a year. Um, uh, fishermen do not want to lose their nets. They're expensive. Uh, so we, um, we believe these numbers. Um, the technology is also improved, so it's easier uh, to hold on to one's nets. Um, and uh, so one of the things that happens is that people call us and tell us that they have found a net. And that's what they can look like on the surface if we're lucky enough to have a recently lost net that still has all of its um, uh, buoys attached to it. Now these older derelict nets, of course, uh, don't. They've long since uh, lost any flotation, um, and um, so they're, they're secret down there. So we have a reporting and response and retrieval program that attempts to address those newly lost nets. Um, and you can see here um, the, the little colored dots, they're kind of hard to see. Um, we um, had uh, 10, let's see, in um, uh, one, and, one uh, and a half years, from June 1st, uh, 2012 to December 31st, 2013, we uh, had um, uh, 10 nets that were reported that we could remove. Seven um, were, were unknown. We, we don't know what happened to that net. Um, uh, two were not found. And, t and four more were, were found to not actually be derelict gear. Um, and it was something else that someone might have called in to us, um, but we, we did in fact um, respond to it as if it were a derelict net. So um, just a couple of quick notes there. Non-tribal fishermen are required to report lost fishing gear within 24 hours. When they do report that gear, the call comes to um, our office. We manage the um, derelict fishing gear hotline. Um, and um, as soon as we get that report and can get some basic information to verify, we will dispatch a vessel to um, go look for that net if not on a day like today, however. So our uh, safety of our crews is sometimes going to get in the way of immediate retrieval. Um, and tribal fishers, um, they're required to report um, under the NOAA harvest rules. And so generally what they do is they report to their tribal fishing entity. Um, and then oftentimes they dispatch their own vessel. Um, and some tribes prefer to just call us and have us do that piece of work. Um, so we're currently, you know, all of this is always, you know, funding dependent like everything else, um, all good works. And uh, so we, um, we chorus, we are funded to do outreach to the tribes um, as well as to fishing groups um, so that they understand um, the non-punitive nature of the new law um, and uh, uh, gain their cooperation. And we have pretty good support from um, uh, a, a variety of organized fishing groups, uh, the, the Gill Netters associations and such. Um, so we're, we're still kind of figuring this out. That's why we say program is in the pilot stage. Um, because we're continuing to figure out how, how do we best um, reach out to these groups um, and maintain those strong relationships that will get them, those fishers, reporting those nets as soon as possible. 
So let's talk a little bit about crab pots. Um, we have um, in our region, of course, a robust commercial and recreational crabbing um, environment, and um, a lot of crab pots are lost, of course. Um, as of last December, we had removed um, 3,218 crab pots from the, from the area. You can see them all here. Very different um, where they tend to cluster, a lot of them down, um, uh, more in the coastal areas of the mainland. You got a little, little bit out here, but nowhere near as much as we see down like Port Susan Way and, and on into the Sound. Um, we uh, estimate that there are about 12,000 crab pots lost on an annual every year. Um, and this is a really different problem than uh, uh, gill nets. Uh, because here we're dealing with maybe about 2,000 pots lost by commercial fishers and about 10,000 lost by recreational fishers. And so the outreach problem is, is a little bit more challenging because we're no longer talking through targeted fishing associations and to a small number of commercial guys. We're now talking to everybody who might throw a crab pot in with the grandkids one summer afternoon and, and lose it. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of a more challenging nut to crack. Um, it's also challenging because um, unlike derelict fishing gear, when we remove those nets, we know we're, we're probably going to get to be able to say we're done one day. With crab pots, given the scale of the loss, we're not sure if we will be able to be done. Um, one of the other challenges is that um, a crab pot can fish for two to three years. Um, and even pots with properly used cotton escape cords, which are, are to rot away um, in case of loss, um, many of them continue to fish because the uh, door doesn't open, the, um, uh, uh, it gets jammed up against something, organisms still can't escape from those pots. So uh, cotton escape cord is part of the solution, but it's not going to fix the, um, the fact that these pots are a real problem for, for crab. And we're beginning to find more um, rockfish in the, in the pots as well. And so they may be um, yet another stressor for, for endangered rockfish. Um, that data is yet to be gathered up. Um, so our next step with crab pots is to start to explore um, other solutions, and those might be uh, to pilot various technologies that might um, come into play when a, when a pot is lost, for example, um, to uh, make it easier to find and retrieve your lost pot, um, or to make uh, escape easier by having the entire side of a, your pot fall open, for example, or other methods to uh, make their loss um, less problematic. So I just always look at that and I think, wow, 12,000 pots a year. That's a lot of pots. Um, and that's, that's what it looks like um, on a regular basis when we, when we pull these pots. And remember, too, that you know, um, all these guys right here were found in a pot. They'll eat each other. So these guys ate the crabs that were in the pot in the first place. And so you don't really know how many um, crabs uh, met their end in that pot um, because you, you um, don't know how many um, had already been eaten. So uh, back to the known problem and uh, the solutions that we can come up to. Um, we believe we have about uh, 700 more target nets um, to go after um, here in um, our, our waters. Um, and remember, these are only nets at 105 feet or less that we can safely get to with divers. Um, we, um, deep water nets are, are on the list. Um, so we are uh, working on verification for all of these targets, and um, uh, we will often send out a boat, a fast boat with just one diver, to determine whether or not is that really a, a net there. Um, and then we'll, we'll go back once we have identified a, a region of nets. Um, and we'll spend some time, we spent a lot of time off the west side of San Juan Island, 
Um, and so we'll, we'll come out, we'll know that they're there, and we'll um, pull several nets um, over the course of several days um, to make our, our work more efficient. Um, as you can imagine, this is kind of expensive work. Uh, we're, we've got, you know, we got the fishing vessel, we've got the divers, uh, we've got a lot of insurance policies, um, and uh, so we try to do it as efficiently as we can. Um, and so then the next step for us is really going to be about deep water nets. We believe that we will um, complete our work on shallow water nets by the middle of 2015. Um, and um, the, the legislature believed that as well. And uh, last year, um, in a surprising year when no one got much good out of the legislative budget session, we got some funding to um, help us finish the, the shallow net job. So we're very excited about that. Um, but we then have these deep water nets. Um, and limited surveys have been done about deep water nets. Um, they're no, by no means uh, exhaustive. Um, we are currently in um, the phase of trying to develop um, some protocols for safe removal. Um, and we did uh, uh, develop um, several different protocols that could be used and we're seeking funding to pilot them and see um, how we might best go after it. We believe that we will end up using uh, ROVs uh, and we have a, a project upcoming to work with the state to use uh, their um, uh, little remotely operated vehicle to go down and, um, and uh, see if we can safely uh, pull a net. So um, there you go, our next steps are to um, finish the shallow water net removals. Um, to uh, pilot this deep water uh, work um, and to continue the uh, refinement of our reporting and retrieval program and to really try to get our brains around this challenge of crab pots and uh, would we be best spent putting our resources into uh, uh, pulling crab pots over and over and over forever or would we be best uh, best uh, served to pilot new technologies uh, for uh, crab pots that would be um, either self-destructing or um, more easily found. Um, so that's your next X prize there. How do you how do we uh, get these crab pots out of the out of the ground? Um, we also um, have seen a lot of problems, similar problems in uh, the Canadian waters of the Salish Sea. So we've been working with Canadian partners to try to help them develop their own retrieval programs uh, to begin doing uh, similar work. We know it works in this sort of environment and they can um, use our protocols up north. Uh, we've also worked with some of the Alaskan tribes to help them begin to um, think about ways that they could take these protocols and apply them as well um, in waters up north. Um, and I would say more broadly that derelict fishing gear has really been identified as a potential challenge for marine mammals uh, worldwide. And uh, so we've been involved in conversations um, uh, up to the um, whaling commission level to ensure that derelict fishing gear is being considered as a, as a stressor uh, to, um, to um, particularly whales around the world. Um, this is where we get our money from um, and of course you'll recognize all those, all those agencies when you start um, uh, thinking about where your tax dollars go. I think these are dollars well spent and uh, so I want to acknowledge um, all those folks. Um, I particularly am um, just thrilled that we were able to receive some directed funding from the legislature this last year to, f to be able to finish the job and uh, when we do we'll have a big party. Um, so I'm not Joan Drinkwin, um, but if you have specific detailed questions you're welcome to get a hold of, of Joan um, and you're also welcome to follow us on Facebook. We regularly post uh, little videos like the one that you saw as well as um, uh, conversations about what we're finding and learning about as we, as we do this work. So um, I would um, welcome your, your thoughts and your questions. Um, now we're um, right on time. <laughs>